Welcome everyone again um, to this second uh, fellows lecture at the American Academy in uh, this very spring semester. It's entitled Lithium Futures in Chile, Argentina and the United States and will be held by our spring Axel Springer Fellow, Javiera Barandarian, who is currently Associate Professor of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. The Axel Springer Fellowship was um, established in 2003 um, with the help of uh, Axel Springer SE and our trustee Matthias Döpfner, to whom we are extremely grateful, that uh, they enable us um, to experience firsthand <laughs> the intellectual depth, the curiosity and the liveliness that Javiera brings to the American Academy. It's really great to have you here. During her fellowship at the Academy, Javiera will work on a transnational history of the three oldest lithium brine mines located in Chile, Argentina and the United States, and she focus, focuses on how stakeholders used economic and geologic expertise to promote lithium development and what the environmental impacts are. And in doing so, she advances our understanding of the kinds of knowledge we need in order to build a more sustainable and a more equitable post-carbon energy future. Thank you for that. Before we begin, I would like to build on an academy tradition and this is an obsession with introductions. Um, so I will introduce the introducer. <laughs> and she is here because she is simply the person to tell you about Rajeva. She knows it all. And this is Professor Barbara Goebel. So she has asked me to keep it short. So um, just before this introduction, she kindly handed me her pen and I crossed out half of what I've prepared. Um, so uh, here's the short version. Um, since 2005, Barbara has served as the director of the Ibero-American Institute of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation here in Berlin, which many of you probably know um, because it hosts the world's, the world's largest libraries or one of the world's lar largest libraries of, in Latin America. She's a renowned ethnologist and social anthropologist, and she has taught and researched at numerous universities in Germany, as well in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, and Peru, and I'm here naming just a few. She is currently an honorary professor at the Freie Universität Berlin. Now I will skip everything she has done, because she asked me to do so, and just wanted to focus on a very recent research project she was part of, and that was a project uh, on the study uh, to study the relations between the EU, Latin America, and the Caribbean. For the study, the Ibero-American Institute uh, brought together researchers from 19 institutions in both regions, and the result was this. It's a study entitled Mobility, Diversity, Inequality, Sustainability, cross-cutting issues of cultural, scientific, and social relations between the European Union, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Many of you will now think, what is this kind of study? What is this kind of person? It's pretty much everything. And you are right. She is really everything. She knows, she knows it all. She knows about lithium. And most of all, she knows about Javiera. Um, <laughs> So we are extremely lucky and grateful that you, dear Barbara, are joining us tonight and that you have agreed to do the introduction. Before I will give this podium uh, to you, let me briefly explain to all of you the structure of the evening. We will uh, first of all have um, the introduction <laughs> and then uh, Javier's lecture, which will last about 40 to 50 minutes. And then everyone here will have the opportunity to ask questions. For those of who, uh, who are here in the room, you just raise your hand. And everyone who's joining us via Zoom, um, you can pretty much ask questions anytime. Also already uh, during the lecture, um, using the Q&A function at the um, uh, part um, of the Zoom platform. Um, and I would already apologize right now if we cannot take all of the questions. Um, I will be taking the Zoom questions later. And now, um, thank you, Javiera. And please all give a warm welcome to Barbara. Thank you so much.
So thank you very much. And um, of course, I'm not the person knowing everything. Uh, but maybe I'm a person trying to know <laughs> because I'm quite curious and that brought me to research. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Berit Ebert, for this great introduction. Also, John Thomas Elfrinkham, uh, who invited me. Um, and, of course, querida Javiera, um, ladies and gentlemen and dear friends. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce this evening talk uh, by Javiera Barandian for several reasons. Um, I did a lot of and anthrop um, anthropological fieldwork in northwestern Argentina and northern Chile and in the region where, as you should do as a social and cultural anthropologist in the Andean highlands, I lived several years. Um, suddenly, lithium mining started to develop in unprecedented, dynamic ways. So that was the lithium brought us together, and I think we mo met at those long time ago where you had these physical meetings before the pandemic at one of the Latin American Studies Association um, Congresses and um, I really, yeah, I'm very happy um, to have this honor to, to introduce you. And um, as already was mentioned, you are Associate Professor of the Global Studies Department, University of California, Santa Barbara. You're also affiliated to Latin American and Iberian Studies program of the same university. And um, in, um, you are involved with a PhD program on environmental studies. And that also shows that something that many of you would um, also um, um, emphasize that in order to address environmental issues, we have to be transdisciplinary. That means to put the environment in the center of our analysis um, obliges us somehow to take multiple perspectives. And one of the lenses to understand globalization is lithium um, and lithium mining. And um, yeah, I will um, later um, yeah, briefly introduce on that. Um, you started with a BA, a BA, Javier Barandian, at the University of Edinburgh, Political Sciences, then um, Master um, in University of California, Ber Berkeley in Public Policy, and a PhD 2018 at University of California, Berkeley Environmental Sciences. And I think this is also characteristic of many social scientists working with environmental issues that this uh, cross-disciplinarity is also part of the education. And you got the, the Berlin Prize of the American Academy. And for me, I should also add, this is a great honor to be here because I appreciate very much the work of the um, American Academy. I myself am the director of an institution who is somehow like a connecting bridge um, of different perspectives and um, countries. and. I think this is very important, specifically in this time where trust is our most appreciated capital. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I would like to, to mention some of your publications, your most recent publication, because it's a long list. I think one of the books was here. Maybe we can show it, because um, yeah, Science and Environment in Chile. Um, and um, one recent book on Derechos de la Naturaleza in Chile, Argumentos para su Desarrollo Constitucional, co-authored uh, with Victoria Belemi, Gabriela Bordiles, and Esio Costa. Um, also, um, uh, article 2020, documenting uh, rubble to shift baselines, environmental assessments, and damaged glaciers in Chile. It's one of the key issues in the Andean regions, the um, yeah, disappearance of glaciers. And I always like to com compare in my classes Alps and the Andes, because both are transnational regions. They're not considered, the Andes, to be a global hotspot on environmental issues, different to Amazonia. And if you would look at maps, and we are um, host a library with the largest collections of maps on Latin America and the Caribbean, you would not find a map, um, as in the Alps, um, looking at the whole region. Uh, we still um, have in um, 
not only infrastructures of knowledge, but also in the knowledge production, a strong national configuration. And I think environmental issues to discuss them also obliged us to transcend those national boundaries. And um, yeah, this is also uh, why I appreciate your, your work very much, because it always has a comparative perspective. Comparative um, perspectives are important in social sciences for getting insights, but they need funding that allow to connect different research. And if you look at Latin American funding agencies, you would say that you would see that there are very few programs trying to combine uh, research uh, from different Latin American countries. This is quite different to the US American situation or the European situation. And therefore, I also like to introduce my colleague Bettina Shaw. Um, she's uh, managing a program financed by the German Development um, Ministry of Development, BMZ, um, and executed by the DAAD, who is addressing, called Trandes, who is addressing to um, um, exactly that issue. And as somebody, um, and we both are, have been working in the Andes, um, it's also our joint effort to position the Andes as a region that should be taken into account, which is quite different, as I said, to the Alps, where you would find a lot of maps on climate change and future biodiversity scenarios, etc. Um, so it's um, another publication is a book chapter in 2021 I would like to, to mention, Effective, Democratic or Neither, Assessing 30 Years of Neoliberal Environmental Management in Chile and Beyond in an Oxford Handbook of Comparative Environmental Politics. And I think public policies regarding environmental issues are also part of your interest. And if I understood correctly during this, your research stay here in Berlin, um, you would like to develop your book on driving development, the lithium trade in the Americas. So why lithium is so interesting? Um, you will present, uh, Javiera, Barandia, Javiera Barandarian will present this evening some of the results of her current studying, studies on lithium trade in the Americas. The title of her talk, Lithium Futures in Chile, Argentina and the United States, puts a mineral resource in the center, which has gained in the last couple of years an unprecedented mediatic and social visibility, lithium. Lithium is the least dense or the lightest metal. It is present everywhere, more or less, in the air, in oceans, in rocks and brines. It has been exploited for many decades, since the beginning of the 20th century, for diverse industrial and pharmaceutical uses. That means lithium exploitation and commercialization is nothing new. But it has gained recently global strategic relevance as a key strategic resource of the green economy. The development of low carbon lifestyles and new green technologies for the world market in the so-called global north, in particular the transition towards electric mobility and towards a green energy matrix with a high share of renewable energy, solar and wind energy, has put lithium in the center of our interest, together with other strategic minerals. Both transitions face, that means the transition towards electric mobility and the one towards a greener mix of energy, face the challenge of an efficient and flexible storage of energy. And because of its specific attributes, lithium is a key element for the development of efficient, light, and flexible batteries. So lithium became a metaphor of clean progress and green growth, not only in the centers of the so-called global north of techno-industrial developments, but also in the countries and some countries of the so-called Global South with large lithium reserves. Chile, Argentina and the United States hold important lithium reserves in, in salt lakes, that means in brines. 
For example, the so-called lithium triangle in the Andes, covering the Salar de Atacama, mainly the Salar de Atacama in northern Chile, the Salar de Uyuni in Bolivia, and many smaller salt lakes in northwestern Argentina. There you can find 70% of the world wild brine reserve. Despite the fact that in those salt lakes are many minerals of great economic value, for example, boron or potash, and particularly potash, until a couple of years, economically was much more important because it is one of the key elements for fertilizers for agribusiness, and it will again, due to the war, regain importance. Lithium became, in these countries holding those reserves, a strategic resource. At the national and subnational levels in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, the lithium hype, I would like to call it, created the expectation that through lithium mining, the peripheries will be able to connect in more equitable ways with the global north in a sense of a fast-track development mode. These de very optimistic imaginaries of lithium do not take the unequal configurations of the value chains of lithium into account, and therefore your work is so important. Um, Regions with lithium brine reserves such as Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia have only very limited possibilities to create added value. And you also have to keep in mind that salt lakes are very vulnerable ecosystem. Mining in salt lakes is mining in water. Um, and these salt lakes are, from a regional perspective, have a great value, as we know also in Europe. Um, they play an important role for indigenous cultures and economies. There are crossings of trade roads, there are, there are identity markers, and there are also openings from the cultural perspective of local indigenous people of Mother Earth, Pachamama. Um, so the extraction of lithium has a lot of environmental, social, and economic costs. And I should also add that, lithium, uh, that salt lakes are like encyclopedias of environmental history. So if you mine in salt lakes, you just cut our knowledge on environmental history. It's like you would destroy the library of environmental history of that place. So in that sense, some scientists are also fighting for recognizing salt lakes in the same as the Ramsar Convention to be protected areas. Um, and because of all that, lithium mining is also a very contested type of mining with a lot of um, conflicts. So in some sense, you could say that the development of sustainable lifestyles in some areas of the world are producing unsustainabilities in other areas of the world. Um, and lithium in a lens also shows you the spatial and the temporal dimension of inequalities. Because of course in a regional and national level, public um, institution and through the export of lithium, which is very dynamic, um, are getting funds in order to finance social policy. But at the same time, local population have to cope with the risks and the costs and future generations because of the water and the environmental um, impacts lithium mining or mining in salt lakes have um, have also um, to pay the bill, to say it somehow. So in that sense, um, I think, um, yeah, the work you are doing is very important. I think it's specifically important in, in, in this situation, not only because of the war, but also of the Green Deal of the European Union, because we have to understand better the interconnectivity, the entanglements, also from an inequality perspective. And we also have to understand better uh, the market of lithium, which um, is not, um, 
which is traded in very specific way and um, also has um, um, a lot of um, monopolistic um, features in the value chain. There is a huge discussion, as most of us here in Europe would know, on lithium um, in Europe. I don't know whether you know the last very conflictuous um, exploitation project in Spain. There is a huge discussion on recycling of lithium batteries. Um, and um, I think there's also a great discussion in Chile, in Argentina, but also in the United States, how to take advantage of the lithium uh, boom um, and also take into account the social, environmental, and um, from a local perspective also economic costs. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your talk and the further discussion, and thank you to all of you to come and listen to Lithium. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Barrett. Thank you to all the wonderful staff at the Academy, uh, the donors that have made it possible for me to be here today as a Berlin Prize recipient. And thank you especially to Barbara for that very warm, uh, very thorough introduction. As you can see from her introduction, there is a lot to talk about complicated. There's, you know, an economist or a public policy person would say there's trade-offs involved. Um, I'm going to be approaching it tonight trying to think like a historian, so bringing a slightly different uh, perspective to all of this. I do want to acknowledge my funders. As Barbara said, it's uh, expensive and hard to do uh, transnational research, and I've been very lucky to have funding from my home campus at UC Santa Barbara, and also from the National Science Foundation, in addition now to the American Academy. And I also want to acknowledge the work of my many collaborators in academia, in law, and in activism. There's a really large network of us working on lithium uh, from different angles and perspectives, and it's, um, it's a really wonderful network. It, Many of you might be listening online, and I'm very thankful for the work that you do that I build on, and I want to acknowledge the resolve that many of them have in carrying out some of the activism that they often face pressures to stop that kind of work. Um, so let's get started. Um, as Barbara said, a lot of media attention around lithium, not just recently. So this is an article from 10 years ago. It came out in The New Yorker. Um, and the byline, I remember, caught my attention when I was still a graduate student at the time. Uh, can, Bolivia, can Bolivia become the Saudi Arabia of the electric car era? And as someone who comes originally from Chile and from Argentina, where lithium deposits also exist, I found the possibility of becoming like Saudi Arabia absolutely alarming. Because to me, this signals more for an intervention, war, environmental destruction, and grossly unequal development. So the prospect of the electric car era, which I had been looking forward to, suddenly seemed like more of the same at the global level and more conflict at the local level. Ten years later, and despite all the cautionary bells, just last week another dire IPCC report and a tragic war in which mineral and energy resources play a part, uh, the possibility of defining even more territories primarily by their place in the global mineral supply chain seems even closer. So the question, can Bolivia become the Saudi Arabia of the electric car era, equates the diverse dreams of Bolivians and of Saudi Arabians with trade. Even without using the term strategic, the byline holds an ambiguous promise that becoming the strategic provider of a strategic mineral could perhaps catapult southern nations into holding some kind of global power. Wrong way. So my goal tonight is to inspire you to think differently, 
to think of lithium not as a strategic commodity, but as an element of nature. My goal is to inspire you perhaps to even pledge to never again think of lithium or any other material, and certainly not of any territory as strategic. Instead, I ask that you think of lithium and all the minerals that we need today as elements of nature to be used with humility and with care. So tonight I'll be speaking first about how lithium is mined and some of the problems. Then I will talk about different ways in which uh, we imagine lithium and how this is reflected in constitutional reform happening in Chile right now. Um, I'll link this to historical memories of development and environmental change in Chile, and I'll finish by arguing for the rights of nature, rights of nature doctrines, to reorganize our relationship to nature to better cope with the existential crisis we face. So as Barbara said, I'll be talking about lithium because many think, some say, it may save us from climate change because of its use in electric vehicles, and I'll focus on Chile because it is a major producer of lithium. Very likely, most if not all of you are carrying Chilean lithium in your pocket right now in your cell phone battery. Um, due to time restrictions, I will mention the United States and Argentina only in passing, but we can talk about it in the Q&A if you like. Uh, this is part of research in process, um, and I'm aiming to analyze mining holistically, or cutting across minerals and across time. A lot of the scholarship examines are one mineral at a time, or one country at a time, even one company at a time. And I wanted to tell an integrated story of how resource nationalism, modernization, and globalization manifest through the imaginary of lithium as a strategic resource in Chile and abroad. Uh, so it's very much a global story, even though I'll be focusing on Chile. So when we think of lithium as strategic, we advance the ideals that underpin the political and economic systems that have brought us to this critical juncture. It is relatively easy to change our language, you know, away from strategic commodity to talk of lithium as nature. By the end of the talk, I hope to have persuaded you of the, for the need of a profound shift towards thinking of lithium and the ecosystems from which it comes as crucial to the sustainability of life on this planet and therefore in need of basic rights like you and I have. Lithium. So the scale and intensity of lithium mining has increased dramatically in the last five years due almost entirely to the increase in demand for electric cars. Um, lithium is lightweight and is used in portable batteries. We don't really need it for stationary batteries. It's about the portability. Go global production of lithium has more than doubled in under 10 years, from about 38,000 to 100,000 tons um, in a, you know, around five years, so a very short period of time. And production is increasing of many other minerals. So we're not, this is not a problem only of lithium. It's a problem of all minerals that we use for, um, for low carbon energy technology. So all the technologies that don't burn fossil fuels. According to the International Energy Agency, to stay within two degrees Celsius of global warming, which is the weak version of the Paris Agreement, um, this requires increasing the production of some minerals by 450%. That's obviously a lot, and that is why uh, mining around the world should be under intense scrutiny. Uh, so lithium in South America, lithium mining happening, happens in the high altitude, dry deserts of Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, and also Peru, they say. And this is a close-up of the area. Um, so uh, of, these are the oldest uh, uh, brine lithium mines. So this is the Salar de Atacama in Chile, where two companies operate, Salar de Hombre Muerto in Argentina, where one company operates. This is a new facility that opened relatively recently. And this is the Salar de Uyuni that Barbara was talking about, which has large amounts of lithium, but is not currently under commercial production. Not on this map, of course, is Silver Peak, Nevada, which is the oldest uh, lithium brine mine in the world. Uh, it's located in the Nevada mountains between the border with California and the U.S. federal government uh, test site for nuclear weapons. There are two types of lithium deposits, rock 
um, and brine. I will be focusing on brine, but this is the rock deposit. This is the largest rock lithium mine in Greenbushes, Western Australia, just south of Perth. And rock lithium mining is a lot like mining for copper or gold. Uh, dynamite is used to explode the rock. Diesel trucks are used to carry the rock outside of the pit. Um, uh, you have a waste pile for the sterile rock, so all the leftover rock, and you have a waste pile for the chemicals and the fine rock particles that are left over from the process. It's a water intensive process. And about 10 years ago, most people thought rock lithium mining was just too expensive to be worth it. But this is where we've had the largest expansion in the last decade in rock lithium mines in Australia, China, um, but also Portugal, Quebec, uh, Spain, Serbia, that also just defeated a, a similar project. This, by contrast, is what lithium uh, brine mines look like. Uh, this is the Salar de Atacama, as seen from a commercial flight. So lithium from brines is a lot cheaper, and compared to the open pit rock mining, it's less destructive. Brines are mixed, brines are water mixed with salts and elements like lithium, also boron, uh, potassium that's used in fertilizers and also very valuable. The brines sit underneath these large salt flats, which are terminal old lake ba uh, basins. They're pumped out from underneath the ground. Here you can see some of the wells and they are left to evaporate in these evaporation ponds. So the different colors represent the different chemical phases as the minerals in the brines uh, concentrate and crystallize, and then the crystals can be collected for uh, processing. This kind of mining exists only in Chile, Argentina, and Nevada, um, and there's pilot schemes in China and in Bolivia. So, Brine lithium mining is extremely water intensive. Fresh water is used in a number of processes, but also the water content of the brines is lost to evaporation. 95% of the water in the brines evaporates into the air. So this has led many activists and scholars to describe lithium brine mining as a form of water mining. This is a typical uh, pumping, so this will be transporting brines from the site to the processing facility. So the use and loss of water has tremendous impacts because this is happening in deserts where it, water is extremely scarce. These deserts are home to communities, indigenous and recent arrivals, both human and non-human, who know how to live with water scarcity. This might be a useful skill to have in the future. And many of them complain bitterly about the negative impacts lithium is, uh, mining is having alongside cli climate change and alongside other economic activities. It's worth mentioning, lithium is not a renewable resource. It is, has accumulated in the salares for millions of years, and the brine is not replenished on any kind of modern human time scale. Lithium is not particularly scarce, although you will read that over and over again in the media. It is only cheap lithium that is scarce, where cheap is determined by the same market and political forces that have led to climate change. So with editorial support from the Natural Resources Defense Councils, some colleagues and I, uh, James Blair, Ramon Balcazar, and Amanda Maxwell, um, we have just launched this report that details the social and ecological impacts lithium brine mining is having in South America. And in it, we make several recommendations. Uh, first, uh, recommendations around how to make decisions about mining more democratic and accountable to local communities, especially to indigenous communities that have historically been among the most harmed by industrial activity. We also make recommendations to raise environmental standards in various ways. Third, and I want to emphasize this, we need policies that leave behind the individual car and that emphasize reusing and reducing mineral use. So this includes collective transportation, energy efficiency, battery designs um, that allow for reuse, which is not currently the case, and many other measures. Finally, we also recommend a moratorium on lithium uh, brine evaporation because after 40 years of operations, it has not yet been confirmed that extracting such large amounts of water from an extremely arid ecosystem does not cause irreversible harm. 
But I want to close this section by emphasizing that rural and indigenous communities are among the most directly impacted by the rush to expand mining for low carbon technologies. Those who have been among the most punished historically by colonialism and by modernization are being asked once again to sacrifice their livelihoods for our well-being in the name of progress. If in the name of mining, they are displaced also from these lands, then we will all suffer from a loss of cultural diversity and a loss of local knowledge. So this image captures Veronica Chavez um, in an area Barbara knows very well um, in northern Argentina, where she shares that, quote, the impact of mining on us will be pain. Pain because the salad for us is like a mother who is being killed and we would be out of work. So this is one of several interviews that my colleague uh, Luis Martin Cabrera at UC San Diego has done and has posted online if, if you wanted to see some of those. I also invite you to take a look at the Environmental Justice Atlas. They have just published online also a map of the Americas from Quebec to Patagonia, identifying 25 conflicts happening right now uh, of communities protesting mines that are directly related to the provision of minerals for low carbon technologies. One of these conflicts is uh, Thacker Pass, Nevada, which you see here. Um, local indigenous peoples working with local ranchers there have occupied the site in protest at what would become the, a massive rock lithium mine, the largest in the United States, with an open pit, waste piles, truck, truck traffic explosions, the works. Imaginaries. So I began this research in 2014. Um, and at that time, I identified three ways in which various stakeholders across Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia were thinking about the future of lithium. One group thought of lithium as what I call a banal commodity, a commodity best left to the markets where the state just had the duty to promote the market by granting concessions quickly and by producing information about production and prices. Another group, this is what I'll be focusing on, um, thought of lithium as a strategic commodity, too important to be left to the market and therefore best managed through state control, for example, through subsidies, production, uh, production subsidies, tariffs, cartels, um, the like. And a third group at the time uh, was promoting lithium as, with a socio-technical commodity, that is as a foundation of a new kind of scientifically and technologically sophisticated development where the state had a duty to invest in research and development and the hope that this would be a more globally equitable and empowering form of development. Um, so for South American states, after decades of resource nationalism and of neoliberal privatization, this seemed like a very inspiring and exciting um, idea at the time. However, none of these imaginaries included the climate crisis. Um, back when I did this research, before the Paris Agreement, before a coup in Bolivia, before the uprising in Chile, uh, the socio-technical imaginary seemed to be on the ascendant. That seemed to be the one that, that was going to happen. Today, after COVID, Trump, Brexit, and a new European war, the strategic imaginary uh, seems to be reasserting itself as countries compete to secure their supply chains and relocalize or onshore manufacturing capacity. So free trade globalization appears to be giving way to a renewed resource nationalism. Resource nationalism, with its focus on strategic minerals, is driven to some extent by global media and consultants. Um, this is what Thea Rio Francos calls the echo chamber of, of global media and consultants. Uh, so the New Yorker byline that I opened with is an example, but also this magazine cover issued by Benchmark Minerals, a major consulting group. It is driven also by government policies that have redefined climate change as an economic opportunity, and it reflects 20th century politics when mineral diplomacy was subordinate to national security. So in the United States, since the, Korea, the war in Korea in the 1950s, the US federal government has defined national security to include the protection of US consumers and US industry from ever having to sacrifice their consumption. 
missing from this strategic commodity imaginary is the climate crisis, which is a crisis of global inequality. The world's richest people are also those who emit the most carbon. Um, so the 10% richest generated 45% of CO2 emissions between 98 and 2013, while the poorest 50% emitted only 13%. So many people are worried about overpopulation. But we must be more specific. We are too many wealthy individuals who consume too much. If the poorest inhabitants on Earth were to move to Mars, global greenhouse gas emissions would barely fall. So Chile is a global leader in mining, especially for copper and lithium. And it is currently writing a new constitution that will reorganize the rules for mining. This is an exciting moment for Chile. Constitutional reform is happening in response to massive protests. So this is downtown Santiago in October 2019. Um, and it is an incredible exercise in democracy. 155 individuals were elected to write the new constitution with an equal number of men and women, with representatives of, for indigenous peoples for the very first time in Chile, and many avenues for public participation. The goal is to replace the 1980 constitution, which was written by the military dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. It's a constitution that makes legislation difficult to pass and that creates a subsidiary, a subsidiary state, meaning the state, can, uh, state officials can only do what they are expressly allowed to do by law, while the private sector can do everything that is not expressly forbidden. So I am happy to talk about the Constitutional Convention all night in the Q&A. Uh, now I will just share just one small part of the action. There's a lot of it, as you can imagine. Um, all citizens were invited to make their own proposals uh, to the Constitutional Convention, and many actually did. 3,000 proposals in total were submitted, almost 3,000. Each proposal then had to be endorsed by at least 15,000 voters to be considered for inclusion in the new constitution. 78 proposals got the necessary endorsements from almost 1 million participating voters. These are the four proposals that got the most endorsements, so over 24,000 uh, individuals voted for each of these, um, presented to the Convention's Environment Commission. And together, they show how different imaginaries about lithium and mining are battling it out for inclusion in the new constitution. So in yellow are what I call two alternative imaginaries um, that seek constitutional rights for nature and for animals. And in blue are two proposals that represent more continuity than change. One promotes the status quo. It mixes elements of uh, lithium and copper as banal and strategic commodity. And the other calls for expropriating copper and lithium companies because it treats these as strategic commodities. This one was not the only proposal uh, to call for nationalization. In total, at least another seven proposals did also, and at least one other got uh, past the 15,000 um, 15, endorsements necessary. This one was the very first of all the 3,000 proposals to get the 15,000 um, endorsements necessary, which says a lot about how popular the idea of nationalization still is in Chile, even though it's not an idea that's actually ever gone away uh, legally um, or in practice. Uh, we have still a state-run copper company. Um, so several other proposals seek to expand the benefits of clean energy to more Chileans by advancing national development, thank you, and committing the state to deal with climate change. It is still too early to tell uh, what the new constitution will look like. They're probably voting right now on uh, what the property, uh, the articles around property rights um, will be. Um, I am hopeful, however, that these debates about the role of minerals and energy in national, national life will advance transformative change. 
Some citizen-led proposals, in particular those for nationalization, confirm that many in Chile see in lithium a medium for continuing the progressive political projects that emerged first with nitrate mining in the early 20th century and then with copper mining in the mid-20th century. So in other words, and as this meme reaffirms, many see in lithium the potential for continuity with a longer history of resource nationalism. This meme reads, with lithium revenues, we'd finally be over our collective depression and we'd have money left to rebuild, overcome poverty, improve education, and even have some fun. Not only is the climate crisis absent from here, but in referring to depression, the meme gestures both to the therapeutic uses of lithium and to a national melancholy that historian Leslie Joe Frazier finds has perme permeated Chilean society since 1973, the year when Pinochet's military coup violently ended progressive political transformations financed by strategic mineral resources, namely copper. So memories. <coughs> For 150 years, the Atacama Desert has been central to global extractivism, providing most of the world's copper and natural nitrates, uh, which are used for fertilizers and for, gun, for explosives, gunpowder. This is a painting and a model of a major, models down here, of a major nitrate uh, mining town in its heyday around 1940. And this is what the town looks like today. Its refineries and ore processing plants are in ruins, and its homes and town center are vacant. The Atacama Desert is littered with the ruins of past industrial activity. This includes infrastructure that was once valuable, as well as abandoned mines, uh, waste of piles of sterile rock, and waste piles of toxic mine tailings. The, the desert is littered also with waste from beyond its borders. This photo is from a news story that got a lot of attention recently. It shows used clothes from the US and Europe that is sold for disposal here. In the 1980s, toxic waste from Sweden was also imported and dumped just north of the Atacama Desert, making children sick for years afterward. And the Atacama preserves also the human remains of some people who were disappeared and killed by the military dictatorship. So in 1973, Jose Saavedra Gonzalez photoed here. He was a high school student when he was captured, tortured, and executed. In 2016, his remains were returned to his sisters. And in 2020, eight military officials were found guilty for his murder. The film, uh, Nostalgia for the Light, by Patricio Guzman, who lives here in Germany, um, poetically captures the quest to find human remains in the Atacama Desert. So Leslie Jo Frazier in her book, Salt in the Sand, analyzes the historical memory in the, Ch in the Chilean desert. Memory, she argues, reflects ongoing political projects, as well as the sense of failed or delayed accountability, which haunts those memories. So I want to pivot to use, uh, analyze this same dynamic in uh, talking about environmental regulation. So environmental regulation relies on scientific studies which record the environmental present which is already very harmed. Scientists have called this the shifting baseline syndrome. It means that most of us alive right now only know already very depleted environments. For example, precious few marine biologists have personal experience of a healthy coral reef, as Iris Braverman recounts in her book, The Coral Whisperers. Even though the desert's aridity preserves so much so well, an encyclopedia, as Barbara said, shifting baselines applies also in the Chilean desert, and thus we forget the environmental harms that we accumulate. So environmental regulation happens primarily through the environmental impact assessment process, or known as EIAs, or for US audiences, NEPA. EIAs are a policy that seek to prevent environmental harms by evaluating the anticipated impacts of a proposed industrial project, like a mine. The evaluation is based on environmental studies and usually also on public input from affected communities. There are many problems with EIAs that I analyze in my book, 
Um, they have been used to privatize data. The consultants hired to do EIAs are accountable to the company, not to citizens. Public participation often just rubber stamps decisions. And many state agencies do perfunctory decisions. So in Chile, officials describe their role in EIAs as being umpires and simply applying the rules. Uh, so in my first book, I examine the origins and consequences of this umpire state ideal in which science becomes a commodity that is bought and sold like any other. And instead of science, rules are seen to confer neutrality. So shifting baselines is yet another problem with EIAs. In recording an already harmed present for evaluation, EIAs naturalize degraded environmental conditions. So in the Chilean desert, current environmental science assumes um, that the salad of today, that the salad as we know today are the same of those 100 years ago. For scientists, shifting baselines is a problem to be solved with better science. However, I argue for states committed to modernization, shifting baselines is not a problem, but a necessary condition for progress. Shifting baselines enable forgetting, and we need to forget in order to cope with widespread and ongoing environmental degradation caused by everyday industrial activity. We can cope because we have faith in EIAs, in good management, in good science, in good monitoring. So to give you a very short example, a 2016 EIA for a lithium mine in the Salar de Atacama claimed the mine's expansion would have zero impacts on wildlife, and it committed to maintaining the number of flamingos, seen here, within their historic range. It referred the reader to Annex 2 for more details. I could not find Annex 2 among the dozens of uh, documents listed online. I checked other chap uh, chapters, but all I found was a table that offered no data. It simply identified the flamingos as vulnerable to extinction and as regular residents of the Salar. So what is this flamingo's historic range that the EIA seeks to hold the company accountable to? We really don't know. It's not in the EIAs, but there's also no population census of flamingos. The Chilean state has not done one. Just yesterday, a group of scientists, which includes a constitutional convention member, um, published an article uh, associating a decline in flamingo numbers with lithium mining. And it's interesting, they use a 30-year data set that they built using structural equation modeling. Um, so uncertainties about the flamingo's historic range is one example of many where EIAs try to assert a historical environmental memory in ways that fail accountability and foster nostalgia for a time when there were more flamingos or melancholy for when they faced no industrial threats. EIAs does help sustain the promises of modernization, even as power has shifted from states to private corporations that now control so much of what we know of a place. Rights of nature. So some salares are home to microbial communities. These are tiny living organisms that first produced ozone and oxygen starting about 3,800 million years ago. That's very soon, geologically speaking, after the Big Bang. And so they may be the oldest living organisms on Earth, and they may be crucial to understanding why we and every plant and animal species on this planet can breathe. And though it receives less publicity than the IPCC, there is a similar intergovernmental panel for biodiversity. Their latest report confirms something that many of us here listening probably already know. We face, uh, you know, nature faces an existential threat, and we as part of nature along with it. Um, some of their key findings include around one million animal and plant species are currently threatened with extinction. The main cause, of course, is land use change of the kind mining uh, brings. Extin extinction is less severe or avoided altogether in areas held or managed by indigenous peoples. Um, and you can read the whole report here. Some think that fighting climate change is regressive. It will harm poor people who want the same quality of life those of us listening now enjoy. And it is true that we have an ethical and historical debt, given how much we have benefited at the expense of others. But the Biodiversity Panel finds that environmental harms caused by climate change are now so bad that they are making poverty worse. 
Biodiversity and ecosystem losses are undermining progress in 35 out of 44 sustainable development goals in areas related to poverty, hunger, health, and a lot more. And just this week, we've been hearing a lot about how war in Ukraine together with climate change uh, will make increased food prices, making life harder for millions. So in short, climate change and widespread environmental degradation are causing an existential crisis which threatens all natural life. The climate crisis is a crisis of consumption and economic activity, where today's high consumption lifestyles are simply unsustainable. And if we think of lithium or minerals or electric vehicles as strategic commodities to compete over and to package and to sell to those who can afford them, we will reproduce the thinking that got us into this existential crisis. So to cling to the strategic strategic commodity imaginary is to reassert a continuity with the geopolitics of the past with all their violence, inequality, and melancholy, while erasing from our records um, memories of a wilder, more biodiverse planet. So how to change? I propose um, that we shift our scientific, legal, and regulatory commitments with the adoption of rights of nature doctrines. In just 15 years, already 29 countries have adopted or are considering adoption of rights of nature. This means recognizing nature's right to exist, right to flourish, and right to regenerate. So the goal is to rectify a grossly uneven legal field and kickstart, kickstart a profound cultural change. For over a century, we have remained wedded to modernization and its central idea that humans are separate from and in control of nature. The cultural change we need and that rights of nature advances starts from the recognition that humans and non-human <coughs> nature are in fact one and the same. So while under modern, modernization, lithium can be seen as a commodity, banal, strategic, socio-technical, all views that ignore the climate crisis, under rights of nature, lithium is an element of nature to be used with humility and extreme care. So this photo is an algae bloom off the coast of Florida of the kind that led 89% of voters in Orange County, Florida, this is where Disney World is based, to approve rights of nature for water bodies there in 2020, the same election where Joe Biden was elected. So 89% is a huge level of support from across the political spectrum and from also the business community out of frustration with EIAs and their many failures. So I believe rights of nature is an old idea whose time has finally come. This year Chile may become the second country to adopt rights of nature in its constitution after Ecuador that has had them since 2008. And there they are having real significant impacts. There have been over a dozen lower court cases and several constitutional court cases. Just recently, the constitutional court revoked two mining uh, permits in this uh, cloud forest for violating rights of nature. And in December, finally, the legislature amended the environmental code to include rights of nature in the EIA. In parallel, there is a rising backlash against mining um, because it is a dirty and often corrupt industry. So El Salvador and now Honduras have both mine, uh, banned mining nationwide, in the case of Honduras, open pit mining. And last year, voters in Cuenca, in Ecuador, Ecuador also voted in a referendum to bind mining in their region. Um, Latin American countries are also working together. This week was the first meeting of the Escazú Declaration, which is a regional environmental treaty that seeks to protect, among other things, environmental rights defenders. In 2020, a record 227 individuals were killed for their environmental activism worldwide. So where is the limit to mining? Will Chile's new constitution and the new government of progressive Gabriel Boric, who's swearing in tomorrow, uh, begin a process by which we can collectively impose limits on mining? Many Chileans hope so, just as many also hope the benefits of mining, as well as the uh, harms, will be more fairly distrib distributed, even if we disagree right now over how best to do this. 
In my talk, I have argued that rather than see mining as a source of economic or political benefits, we need to see minerals as elements of nature faced with an existential climate crisis. We commodify these elements at our peril. So my husband took this photo a few months ago. We were driving south on Chile's Highway 5 through the Atacama Desert, and we came across a police convoy. They asked us to pull over to make room for these mining trucks. So today's mining trucks used in open pit mines are so large, they hardly fit on the roads. This is just the, ch the chassis, so it takes four of these to move just one mining truck. Will we limit mining or will we build bigger roads, bigger ports, bigger landing strips to accommodate this scale of extraction? How many more oil and gas wells, pipelines, and ports will we authorize and invest in to keep this violent economy going? Since 1980, greenhouse gas emissions have doubled, rising, uh, raising average global temperatures by 0.7 degrees Celsius already. Um, also in 1980, Germany's OCO Institute um, called for the Energy Wende, which was only passed as policy in 2010. And now, over a decade after that, Germany still has a dire dependency on Russian fossil fuels. So progress has been very slow. If we think of lithium as a strategic commodity, we will replicate the political and economic systems that have brought us to this point. Systems that naturalize already degraded environments while sustaining the illusion of good management um, and good science, uh, good scientific management. So we need an epistemic cultural legal shift um, that begins with thinking of lithium as an element of nature and of lithium-rich brines as part of life-giving ecosystems that are home to the microbes that first produced ozone and oxygen on this earth. If we think of them all as subjects with rights like you and me, then maybe we can begin the repair process needed for human and non-human nature to survive. Thank you. Oh, so it's open for questions. Um, I will be calling on people, so go ahead and raise your hands. And uh, if you're online, uh, Barrett will be uh, looking at the online questions. Uh, yes, Ulrike. Yes. Yeah, Ulrike Hamann. Uh, I'm a journalist working for the TATS. I've got two questions. One is uh, specific. Uh, it's about the water consumption in uh, these salt lakes, uh, which is very contested because some people, even those uh, who work for climate protection, say, well, it's no problem to take out this kind of water because it's salt water. It's not fresh groundwater uh, that evaporates uh, in the salt mines, but it is, of course, salty water because lithium is a kind of salt. So where's the problem? It's not about fresh water. So this would be the first question because uh, many people think, I, uh, I, as far as I know, as far as my impression is, that it is groundwater, uh, fresh water that is being used. So what's the problem of using salt water? And my second question is, I uh, really agree that we cannot have green growth, but what, what would be you, your alternative uh, if uh, lithium was just nature, as everything else is just nature? Then, of course, we would have to live as indigenous people do because that's the only way of protecting nature, as you, you yourself stressed. But you only have to look around this room. We do not live like indigenous people. So what is our future? Yeah. Um, so on the, the water issue, um, there's a couple of different ways of answering that. So I could go into the technical details of what we think we know right now of some of the specific debates and there's questions there about the degree of connectivity between the freshwater aquifers and the salty brine nucleus aquifer um, with you know every month there's a new scientific article that sort of pushes the debate in slightly one way or another um, 
there's different ways, but but all part part of the problem is that all of those studies th are are looking at this in the abstract. None of the, those the studies that are looking at whether the the two are separate or together aren't factoring aren't, aren't including mining into their models. So they're not including the pumping into their models. They're in that sense they're sort of paradigmatic of what I was describing of this timeless science, sort of ignoring everything, all the life that's been on the Salad for, for the last several decades. Um, we also don't have any studies on what happens with the nucleus as that becomes empty. And in my interviews, people describe that nucleus and what the structure of it in very different ways. So some people describe it as a sponge. Um, other people describe it as um, sort of harder rock material that is fractured. Um, some people say that there's horizontal drilling that happens in the Salad. Part of the problem is that the companies don't have to disclose any information, so we don't actually know for certain how much they pump. Um, some suggest that there's reinjection, but then when you speak with people in the industry, they say there is no reinjection. That would make no economic sense. Um, because in reinjecting, you would be uh, changing the chemistry of the brine, and so this it's it's a very dynamic and very uh, delicate ecosystem where small changes have big impacts that only become noticeable over a long time period, and so it's a very difficult question to answer. Basically, some people are now saying, can we capture all that water that is evaporated out and and use it in some way? Um, that of course would make a lot of sense. Of course, it would be very expensive and technologies that I haven't read about um, as existing. So there's different, different ways to tackle. But for a lot of the local people, it is a problem um, because they, they, they report sort of experiential changes um, that they attribute to this activity. Um, so, so yes, it's, there's, but there's a lot of freshwater use and there's a lot of brine use. But the main freshwater users are the copper companies. And so this is the other way of answering the, the question, and part of why I'm using this approach. It's not useful to zero in on one mineral, because we don't use lithium by itself, right? The electric car uses a little bit of lithium, but uses a lot of copper. And what is really drying out the freshwater aquifers in this area specifically is the copper mining. Um, and so the copper mines there have been sanctioned, and finally, the very weak water agency um, has declared the freshwater aquifer there as exhausted, which is sort of where we get the title of our report. So it's, yeah, so it's not useful to, I think, to, to look at one mineral because we don't use one mineral at a time. To your second question, I think this is where my focus and perhaps my bias as a political scientist and public policy scholar comes back to how do we change the way we make decisions today? So we're not going to change the ultimate, um, I don't think I can change the ultimate outcome of the economy and our growth trajectories and our development trajectories. I can't work from this ideal in the future and then work backwards to think about what kind, what, the, what does green growth look like today? The best I can do is democratize and improve how we make decisions today. And right now we're making decisions in ways that have consistently privileged corporations um, and, and consistently invisibilized nature. And not nature's individual elements, but the ecosystems, right? It's about the relationships between all these ecosystems that allow life um, as we value it to exist. Um, and so that's, that's another reason why I have become an advocate of rights of nature, because it puts the emphasis on today, on what can we do right now to begin right away to change how we think about and how we make decisions. Uh, yes, George. Just one comment to the previous question. The water that vaporizes is pure water. Yes. So. It's not, not the one that up. But it could, it could be used for yeah. different purposes. Yeah? Yeah. 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 My question is, let's assume that the majority of the Chilean population would give you the authority to decide about uh, 
uh, the Constitution. <laughs> how, how would you formulate the, the corresponding articles? I would put rights of nature in the Constitution, um, which uh, there's a lot of support for, um, but was also defeated last week. Uh, so last Thursday and Friday were... We're, we're sad days for those of us who've been for working for the what we call the eco constitution, um, but it's not it's not the end of the road. There's still lots of avenues open. So, um, you know, I, I I've been supporting the work of a lot of people who've been uh, working to. What's interesting about the constitution is that we can think we can think of it in all these different ways. So, small changes to the. 1980 constitution would have a big impact towards enabling the kinds of uh, democratic and policy changes, you know, those of us in the environmental movement, the Chilean environmental movement would want to see. So in some ways, we don't need a radical, you know, an incredible rewrite of the constitution. Small changes would be enough because of what the 1980 constitution really looks like. And, you know, I've mentioned those of so the subsidiary state, for me, that is the number one thing that has to go. Um, and there's just a few other things. So, but then from there, you know, in Spanish we say, you know, asking is free. <laughs> so, so from there, there's been this long, long list, and 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 which reflect an accumulation of many, many years of grievances, right, where people have not felt heard and people have felt shut out of the political process and where you know it's worth emphasizing just how hard the current constitution has made it for um, legislative reform to happen. So two, two or three weeks ago, the Congress and Senate finally approved a reform and a very important reform of the water code. This sat in Congress for 10 years. For 10 years, it kept circling in and out of rooms and hallways and da 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 and it was completely 10 years that Chile has been in, in a devastating drought, um, where now, um, you know, the second city, Valparaíso, apparently has water for less than two months. And um, Santiago, the metropolitan region, where more than half of the population lives, is also, um, you know, they're, they're saying that the, the, the two rivers that sort of feed it are, are um, running dry. So... So that is the, 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 where people are coming from, from the sense of finally we have a voice and we have an opportunity. And so it's become a Christmas tree decoration session where everyone is bringing everything they ever wanted and everything they ever dreamt of and wanting to put it in the Constitution. And so it's been a laborious discussion. It's been a um, difficult discussion. Uh, full of highs and lows. So I don't have a single answer, but I would you know, put rights of nature and things that, have, that are already have been approved, uh, like a plurinational state, recognition of Chile, Chile's indigenous peoples, which were not recognized in the previous constitution. Um, uh, plural, I think plurilingualism was voted on today. Um, and so I think these are all, and, and the big thing to keep, every, all the media, every article you read, now you will begin to see lithium articles every day, I'm sorry. Every time you open a newspaper, you will now see they are there. <laughs> and nearly all of them will talk about nationalization as the big thing. Personally, I think the really big thing is uh, regionalization or decentralization. What will this constitution do for Chile in terms of decentralizing power. So Chile is an extremely, it's like France, centralized state. I cannot think of any other state as centralized as Chile. Um, there's no uh, real local power devolution. So that will happen now. And um, it's not clear yet what exactly it will look like, but that I think is the biggest thing to keep an eye on. Uh, so Damian. Thank you very much, Javier, for this very powerful talk. Um, I think the case of Chile is perhaps unique because we have this specific circumstance now, right, of the constitutional reform. And I wonder if you could say something about cases or countries where we don't have this unique opportunity. What is the strategy of social movements and activists to address this question? 
Bueno, Argentina, you know, Barbara could speak about this much better than I. Um, but in, in Argentina, Argentina, I, when I'm in Chile, I always caution Chileans. I'm like, yes, careful with decentralization. Look at Argentina. And a lot of them know that. But so in Argentina, mining is regulated essentially by the, by the you know, subnational provinces. So similar to the, to the land here or to the U.S. states. Um, so they've pursued different strategies depending which region they are in. Uh, in Jujuy, they have been, I think, more successful than Salta or Catamarca for regions that most Argentinians will, will kind of automatically understand in terms of what the, uh, the, the degree of representation of indigenous peoples in those different provincial governments and, and receptiveness to their um, claims. But uh, there have been... There, ha there has been, in general, um, a real resurgence of, um, of activism around mining. And there is a real, I think there's a real sense of an international um, network of cooperation. Um, so we've seen major um, you know, social, social movement uh, victories against lithium mines in Argentina, in Serbia, uh, maybe also in the U.S., um, so, I, I, yeah, they, they've pursued different strategies, like, you know, direct action, road blockages, but also legal actions. They've been very effective in using the courts um, and using the right to free prior informed consent um, to block uh, uh, mines. And this is also something we've seen in Ecuador and other Latin American countries where, um, where those rights have been stronger than they have been in Chile, uh, at least until now. Yeah. And Nancy and, and Lawrence, I might group you two. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to thank you not only for that wonderful presentation, but also for the work you do, which is so courageous and really important. Um, so living in Germany, I noticed that when I go to the grocery store, on the packages of cigarettes, there are these horrifying photographs mm. of what you look like if you smoke cigarettes after many years. I mean, really gruesome photos of people with cancer in a way that you never see in the States. And that made me think, well, as consumers, part of the problem is that we don't see the consequences of our actions. Mm. And I was just wondering if there is any kind of a movement so that you, know, you buy a Tesla and there's a little panel on it that says, you just killed 10 flamingos and disrupted the lives of a bunch of people living in the desert. I mean, you, you know what I mean, though. Yeah. Like, how do we make it real? It's very easy, as you're talking about imaginings, to imagine that your own actions are really not so significant. That's actually, that's a really great idea. Um, maybe we should, maybe we should talk about it. Um, and, but it's an interesting example because I think also here this does go back to rights of nature because those cigarette, the cigarette labeling was, was fought tooth and nail by the tobacco industry. Um, and so, for example, countries like Uruguay, if, if, if you want to have fun tonight, um, Google, was it um, John Stewart? Did, uh, uh, was it John Stewart or, yeah? And he did a whole piece on Uruguay passing that this kind of labeling law and the tobacco Philip Morris suing them in these private courts owned by multilateral organizations like the World Bank, da 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 da, da which is one example of how the, the, the degree of legal power private corporations have accrued over the last, you know, this is not, this is new. This is, the, these private courts did not exist 30 years ago. These are new things. Um, and so this has increased. And so Philip Morris can sue a small country like Uruguay for doing the same thing that, you know, Germany does. But of course, they're not going to sue Germany. Um, and, and we saw also in Australia, you know, it, these, these laws became very fought by the, by the industry where they could. Um, and so it just goes to show you the barriers to providing and sharing this kind of information and, and part of why it is urgent to think about how to re-level the legal playing field. Uh, Lawrence? 
so as, as I always do, I'll echo what Nancy said about the wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering about your faith in democratization. Um, you might be familiar with this uh, case that was um, recently heard before the U.S. Supreme Court, this West Virginia v. EPA. And um, in that case, it had to do with whether the Environmental Protection Agency has the authority to really kind of aggressively um, control greenhouse gases. And the argument that was being made is that Congress had never delegated that authority to EPA. And so in a sense, the EPA was acting in an undemocratic fashion. And then in order to really democratize the process, the authority had to be given back to Congress, which arguably would be a catastrophe for the effort to really control greenhouse gases. So I wonder if you could maybe talk a little about the tensions, actually, mm. between democratization on the one hand and um, agency-based regulation on the other? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's very specific to the U.S. context, right? Because democratic power is distributed differently, certainly in a you know, civil law country like Chile. But I think the, the broader point about, um, about citizens, right? For, I think for a long time, a lot of people would say we haven't seen more action on climate change at the global level because voters haven't wanted it. Um, you know, no one in the U.S. is going to vote. You know, the, the famous example, right, of um, President of, of, was it Carter uh, or Ford um, sort of putting up the solar panels on the White House roof and then, you know, Reagan brought them down um, sort of in his first day in office. Um, and and this, this, the historical narrative for a long time was that he made the strategic mistake of talking about uh, energy efficiency and, and all of that as a sacrifice. Um, you know, and, and, and it's been interesting going back and looking at, you know, my, my line there about the 1950s and the Korean War is looking at how the, the, the stockpile, the U.S. stockpile for critical minerals was managed at the time and the changes to decision making that were implemented at the time. And it was very much about wanting to avoid asking citizens to sacrifice in any way after all the sacrifices of World War II. Um, so, yes. You know, this kind of thing has probably not been uh, popular, but probably also because we we don't know. And the media continues to portray it in 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 these uh, blasé ways. And I'm thinking specifically of this article that came out within a, a month or two in the New York Times. Um, about you know, this is a critical year for electric vehicles, and it gives the example of this guy who's very excited because he's bought a um, $75,000 electric pickup truck, um, which he's going to be able to use to power his barbecue at uh, tailgate parties, so at the football matches, um, and cook ribs for all his buddies and blare music. And this is not sustainable, right? <laughs> this is someone needs to tell him and the New York Times, apparently, that that is not sustainability, and that is not how we should be using the lithium that we extract at great cost and effort and work. Um, and so I think it's about, you know, we need more leadership. We need more democratic leadership. And yeah, democracy can backfire. So I do, I do, you know, I don't, but I don't think we have any other choice. Thank you for a fascinating talk and for so many thought-provoking um, uh, um, comments. Um, I'm trying to summarize a little bit here. Um, several questions. Um, you were um, talking about the 29 countries um, with nature right laws. Um, so I'm trying to take it, uh, this on the uh, international level. Um, we're always talking about um, the CO2 footprint are there initiatives? Should there be initiatives to talk more about the water footprint, about corruption, about other aspects of, of your topic and uh, what, what has happened so far? Um, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that? Thank you. Yeah, there's been a, a real tendency to reduce climate change 
conversations to CO2, right? To CO2, not even to all greenhouse gas emissions, but to just focus on CO2. And of course, that's that's very useful in a lot of circles. But um, I did want to highlight, you know, these two things are intimately connected, right? How we think about nature and biodiversity, it cannot be separated from water, certainly, and from from energy. And so. And the production of energy is incredibly water intensive, so the, the two cannot be separated. And I think, you know, over dinner we were getting into an interesting conversation when we had to finish about um, the linkages between fertilizers and the energy producing, right? When we we're talking about ammonia and green hydrogen and and that's that in a way that's not new, but we have we have not written history in a way that uh, brings these histories together, right? Um, so, you know, the Atacama Desert is, the, in a way, this privileged place for thinking about that intersection between energy and agricultural, meaning narrowly kind of nitrate fertilizer use policies, um, and the, the what it has meant ecologically uh, to launch into a century of development that was highly intensive in the usage of both of these things, which in turn are very intensive in usage of water. Um, so we need to start thinking holistically. Um, you know, this Maybe that means interdisciplinary work, but I think we need to be thinking across, um, across all these different things. There was something else I wanted to say, but I forgot now in response to that. Oh, at the international level, I will say um, the Committee um, for Biodiversity Protection, the UN organization, which is its main annual meeting was, was partially delayed because of the coronavirus, but Rights of Nature is on the draft. Um, so if that is approved, that would be the fir first time that we see Rights of Nature in an international treaty. So right to your... Um, for ministry to your government asking for that. I was wondering from the very beginning about the right of nature as a concept. Uh, and you just said uh, right to your whatever for that. What is that exactly? Uh, what does it mean to give something like nature right? Right, yeah. Where is the subject? Where is the, how do you individuate the, the, the bearer of right? Yeah. So that will vary a little bit country by country. Um, so the, that's three rights that we're talking about. The right to exist, the right to flourish, and the right to regenerate. Uh, rights of nature complement human environmental rights, so it's not uh, substituting uh, the right to live in a clean environment um, or the right to environmental information or anything like that. It's sort of in addition to. But what it does is that it opens up in um, some jurisdictions the ability for, let's say, for example, you know, a simple early, early case in Ecuador. Um, a family, the city government... Uh, improved a road and that improvement caused a damage to a stream which damaged their property. So they sued the city on behalf of the stream, <laughs> saying that the stream's right to exist and to regenerate and to flourish had been violated by the city. And they did that because they weren't seeking repair for themselves. They didn't want the city to pay them for the damages they had incurred, but they wanted the city to fix the road so that the stream could continue the way it had been. So they had the right to define the subject of the right? Yes. Yes. And you, and you know, you don't just wake up and do this, right? You have to um, argue it well and have your evidence and all of that, yes. Is that all? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I've totally lost track of time. I don't know. <laughs>